Hello everyone and welcome to the week 10 online classroom for ELA 300. This week we're going to be looking at, if I'm following the um, module 3 week 10, we're going to look at poetry. And it's only going to be a quick lecture because of course you have access to the set text which provides so many brilliant ideas for using and teaching poetry in the classroom. So I just want to really give you a broad overview of the, the why of poetry and how I guess, the how as well. So, oh my gosh, there's a lot, there's so much in this area. It's, it's really huge, <laughs> that's the way to start. And yet in the classroom it's often not considered to be taken seriously by the teacher as such a wonderful opportunity to engage students creatively with wordplay and, and risk taking, exploration, having a bit of fun with language and learning about language at the same time. And like the narrative text types, information and um, fiction text types, fictional text types, Poetry offers a range of genres and these genres are fit for different purposes and as with the teaching of any text type, there are numerous issues related to, um, to the approach perhaps, I'll, I'll think about it more from the teacher's perspective to the approach taken. First of all, I'll talk about the poetic genres and not that I need to teach this to you, I mean you can select the genre that you want to engage your students with. The main thing is that you don't think that poetry is just some like boring old rhyming um, sets of verses, but rather I want you to think more flexibly about what constitutes poetry because then you're more likely to experiment with it in your classroom practice. First we have quatrains, so that's you know your standard four lines to a verse and you have your ballads which is like a narrative but it's it usually tells a story and of course ballads are often turned into songs. Just think about there was a wild colonial boy da 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 and, and so you know even with um, as for example, I'll give you an example of how I used a ballad. Um, it was Nidoc Week, which is Indigenous, uh, it's about uh, Indigenous issues and um, so we were all trying to cover something in our classes that covered uh, some aspect of Indigenous what can I say? indigenous uh, histories or practices and one of the things that I did was I looked at how the creation stories were written as narratives and we compared those to our own creation stories so we started with the narratives and so we built some background knowledge about the topic and then I asked the students to write a ballad which is very not indigenous and I did make, make this point very strongly but was supposed to represent the white man's view of the time, something relating to, uh, to what happened historically in um, Australia. And so like the wild colonial boy which is more about a highwayman, can't remember now, maybe I'm thinking about the highwayman, but you know, just to write a simple narrative about a person's experience when they came to Australia and writing it as a ballad. So it didn't need a lot of detail, but just a narrative. And here we have the highwayman, that's more like a narrative poem. You can look that up, of course, so many poems online, that's something that I want to remind you of that if you need poems, you don't have to go out there and buy a poetry book. If you want an anthology, just go online, 
poems for grade three or something like that you'll find a lot and the highwayman the wild colonial boy you'll find those as well online so limericks can be a lot of fun so if you have been watching um, a video on some something topical or even something that happened could it even be something that happened in the past a long time ago you can ask students to summarize what they've read or viewed as a limerick you know you just want to know if they've understood the key key um, aspects of a text or well, you can have a bit of fun in a group write a limerick about what you um, what happened to this person you know uh, free verse is another way of going about that uh, free verse is also really good for exploring experience engaging rewriting and reflecting on experience on emotions and gosh there's so many different contexts and topics that you can cover with poetry haiku is great because if you want students to think about uh, really getting rid of superfluous information in text so really focusing on phrases rather than whole sentences which bits of language can we leave out what that does is it develops lexical awareness in the sense that which words are the ones that carry most impact and meaning and they're the ones that you incorporate in a haiku it's the brevity of the haiku that is supposed to align with an awareness of the fragility and temporality of life of life experience of what one sees or smells or hears it's so temporal one minute's there and then then the moment has passed and it's moved on and that's why you know thinking a little bit around the philosophy of the style of poetry is also so important for older students so that they understand why there are these diverse texts and how they achieve their effect um, a syncane is five lines and the stress is uh, one two one two three four and then back to one and if you want to see more examples look there are so many examples of these text types so just listing these gives you a start on the different kinds of poems once you're into the poet poetry web page as well you you'll be hard pressed to you know tear yourself away there's some great poems out there and um, I've got some websites there to get you started with your searching this is a really good website read write think I think you should should look through this because it's got lots of ideas for teaching and learning activities acrostic poems well let's say you've got the highwayman an acrostic poem might look at each of the letters and you could be free verse attached to each of these so T could free first line free verse T the highway man <laughs> that was very unimaginative wasn't it H so H could be um, so you've got the highway man hiding running that'll do it's free verse I can only have two words and then E ever finding somewhere or e, e would be good for escape escaping the irons of law so you can see what I mean that wasn't very good but <laughs> escaping the heavy chains of such and such and then the next one will start with H and I and so on so if you know what uh, acronyms are that's basically what you're working with and you can use that works really well with free verse it gives and oh, here's another one this one's from Pinterest and uh, what I like about this is it's a shape poem and students especially young children you can either give you know if you want to scaffold or differentiate for some students you could give them the shape but for students who are more creative and imaginative and willing to take make their own pictures and take risks with their poetry well they can create their own shapes you know you'll be surprised at all the different things you, know, you could think of your favorite animal and um, create a shape poem and what it does is it really makes students think about words associated with that creature or that idea or topic 
So here, if we look at this one, we've got hop, worms, sing, robin. It's, it's almost like a brainstorming opportunity. And what a brilliant way to start an information report on birds. So, you know, go outside and look at some birds, point to them. What's that bird doing? How is it moving? You know, talk about what they see, listen, what can they hear, then go inside, talk about what do you know about birds, and then start with the poem, uh, you know, to brainstorm vocabulary. You're walking around, you get a feel for, oh, everyone's writing the same thing. How can I extend their vocabulary so that when they write a little report about what they know about birds, they'll be able to incorporate some new words. So you can see how poetry can be used strategically to support learning. I've got some other things coming up as well as to why, um, why poetry can support learning. So I'll come across that soon. Uh, the epics, epics, oh my gosh, you might think, well, no, the Iliad and Beowulf, no, that's really not suitable for my students. Well, I worked in a Stein school and they did the Nordic myths, including Beowulf, which is quite a, um, a lusty kind of story, but of course you can censor it for the students. And guess what? I found a picture book quite accessible to grade three, four students to read, and it's on the Iliad. So it's, it's about a story of the adventures of a group of sailors from long, long ago, very engaging, and uh, yes, so don't, don't think anything is too difficult. If you find the right text and you introduce it in the right way and modify it so that it's appropriate for the students, then you can share some of these epics. And they're such wonderful stories. Absolutely, you know, some of those old Greek epic stories are amazing. An elegy. Okay, very sad, but you know, if something happens and the mood is already sad, I think it's important that you let students explore their emotions and teach them how to deal with it. Don't, don't suddenly try and change the mood and, and laugh and ha ha ha, because I think uh, students might then start to feel that there's something wrong with feeling sorry for yourself or feeling sad, when really it's very important to address those emotions at the time and simply letting them share, I, you know, it could be free verse anyhow, in any genre, poetic or non-poetic narrative, you know, that. Um, their feelings explore words to describe feelings of sadness and sorrow because without those words, how do students start to address and recognise their feelings, talk about their feelings and um, come to terms with loss and mortality and so on. So, yeah, it is important to, to not ignore, you know, to engage with difficult issues if they, if they happen in the classroom. I was in the class and um, grade three, I think it was, and a beautiful little boy became sick and we d didn't know what had happened to him for a long time. And when he came back, he told us, or his parents told us because he wasn't able to speak, um, that he had a brain tumour. And they were very, really amazingly open with the students. And the children said, why can't he come into the classroom? And uh, the teacher also, I was a specialist teacher there and the teacher said, yes, why can't he? So, you know, I would go into the class and he would be there. Children would be whispering in his ear and talking to him. The parents were, were there too, just to make sure he wasn't too tired. And they would push him around and show him what they'd planted out in the garden. And, uh, you know, he passed away and the children actually went to the, the class, went to the funeral. And it was very comforting for the parents and the children understood they learnt to deal with with this rather than hiding it as if it's something you can't talk about. The children learned how to be respectful and, um, you know, appropriate words of condolences and 
their memories of the little boy were wonderful in their drawings. So, yeah, don't, um, you know, it, there are times when poetry allows the freedom to express and explore emotions and I think that's a very important aspect of the genre. Ode, long reflective poem on a topic. Oh gosh, well you only have to look at some of the uh, canon of British literature and the poetry and you will see that there's a lot on the topic of love, for example. Anyway, these are have a look. There's so many odes there on the internet. Just look up ode, you'll find them. Here's another nice one for young children. One that is uh, really also quite practical in the explicit teaching of synonyms and antonyms. You can see here this one. It starts with monsters, creepy, sinister, hiding, lurking, stalking. You can see two adjectives here and two, th three um, these are called gerunds. <laughs> These are verbs that are acting as nouns. Hiding. Uh, no, sorry. My mistake. Continuous. It's just that the, the sentence is um, not complete. These are continuous verbs. Hiding, lurking, stalking. They are hiding, lurking, stalking. So you can see here the focus is on the key uh, adverbs or descriptive language. Vampires, werewolves, mummies and zombies. Here's your nouns. So we've got the topic. We've got two adjectives. We've got three verbs in the continuous tense where that the, they are. <laughs> and we have examples of monsters, vampires, dun, 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 dun. can you see there is a, it's like a recipe, there's a recipe here and so what you're asking children to do is to follow the recipe and this way you'll get them thinking about oh what kind of nouns, what kind of verbs, what kind of uh, categories of monsters can I list and here we've got, because it's a synonym poem it's the same down this end. Chasing, dancing, eating, hungry, scary. So here again, you've got your verbs, hungry, scary, you've got your adjectives, and you've got your final classification. See, creatures, monsters are creatures. You see, synonym poem. Antonym poem, let's see. We can see day, there's the category, and night, it's the opposite here, so that's the antonym. Bright, sunny, two adjectives with the opposite here. Quiet, dark. For day, laughing, playing, doing verbs. In the continuous tense. <laughs> Talking, resting, sleeping verbs in the continuous tense. And some more information about day and night. Up in the east, down in the west. Really quite challenging when you think about it. And it gets students to think about what synonyms are and what antonyms are. Okay, so I think I've given you plenty of examples of poetic genres or types and let's now think about the purposes and to what use we can put them. Why would we decide to incorporate them? Not as a whole unit on poetry, a lot of people do address it that way. But other teachers, I know, start every lesson with a poem and sometimes the poem is on the topic that they're going to cover that lesson. Sometimes the poem is a mnemonic device. For example, uh, every good boy deserves favours. Mm, that has some strange connotations these days but when we think about it, every, we think about it as an acronym. Every, E, G, every good boy, B. Okay, these are piano scales. And I learnt my piano scale with, you know, reading, this is reading notes on the um, music notes by that acronym, Every Good Boy Deserves Favours. I believe there is another acronym for the planets, the order of the planets. Uh, there's an acronym for... Oh, wow, I just thought of one. Think about the song, 
and remember poems songs are just poetry put into put to music so think about do a deer a female deer they a drop of golden sun do re mi fa so la ti so these are um, also uh, it's a mnemonic device for music for the teaching of music an aspect of music um, I think it, try to think of another one I wish if you can think of some please share them on the discussion board somewhere but um, I'm thinking of uh, well hmm. do you know what I just can't think of one right now um, well I use them in German for example um, if I teach aus nach me oh no well it won't make sense to you because it's in German. Uh, but if I sing so I use singing a lot and all I do is I put what it is I want students to remember into a song. And poetry is really good because instead of having all the bits and pieces, you have the key words in a particular order and you add the music and it helps the student to remember something. Of course, what everyone thinks of first is the main purpose of poetry is to entertain through sound and rhythm and play of words. And, you know, I've put in a bit of a, a cautionary note here. I've got a link to a website, a URL I should say, and I just want you to know that it does include offensive content. So please be warned and do not be angry if you click on, if you uh, cut and paste that URL to your website, then that is your own decision. Uh, to develop students' imagination, of course, through connecting sense, sound, and performance. So it's multimodal. You know, it's not just reading silently. You can do that. That's fine. But it's meant to be spoken. And I think this one here, although you know, with the the caution, you can see how it's a performance. It offers the opportunity to practice your performance skills. You know, how do you present yourself while you're saying this poem? Uh, do you speak quietly? Is there a nice cadence that helps you to get the mood across? Uh, where do you put your emphasis? Do you sing song the poem? So it's also really good for performance purposes. And here are some good ideas for performances. And I think you'll really love, I heard it in the playground by Alan Arlberg some good attempts, one perhaps better than the other, but this is a good way of getting a short video of your students engaging in poetry as a group. Okay? Poetry, like music, can bring students together. And of course, you can use poetry to explore the meaning and power of words and ideas. Again, like I mentioned with haiku, when we you take out all the little busy bits and pieces of language, you're left with an intensification of the flavour of what it is you're trying to get across. You know, if you simmer something long enough, a lot of the water disappears and you get a more intense flavour. Well, this is what poetry can do as well, because poetry does not have to be grammatically correct. And this is what I want to really emphasise. If you teach poetry, don't focus on grammar. Unless, of course, the poem is about grammar. <laughs> so there you go. You can use poems for so many different things. Um, ah, The Road Not Taken. I love this poem. Please do read it. I think you'll see how a lot has been omitted from the poem. And the beauty of poetry is that you're not always told what to think but you're free to interpret the poem as you see fit. And because of the ambiguity of some poems, this means that there's more freedom to the reader. Unlike a example that a 
student in my class gave me where during a meeting with an author, I think it was in Korea, every student in school had to learn this author's poem. It was a year 12 examination poem. And the author was being interviewed on TV and the, the interviewer asked the author if, it would be, if they could ask him a question from the exam. And he said, yes, of course. So they asked him a question and when he answered, why, why did you blah, blah, blah? And he answered honestly and the reporter said, but that's incorrect. <laughs> so, so the point to be made or the point to take away from that is that once the author has written a poem, he is not, he does not, is not the sole authority over the interpretation of the poem anymore. And really, an interpretation of the poem is dependent on the reader's explanation for their interpretation. There's no one reading of a poem that leaves much left to the reader's imagination. I think that's very important. To relate to the experiences of others and look here's another example. I use this because it's just such a brilliant reading and you know when you show this in the context of a video, if you know the, the story, Funeral Blues, again not really appropriate for young children, not the movie, but for, certainly in secondary education I've used this poem and it's, it's quite powerful and you'll see, you'll see why poetry can say things that are not easily expressed in, in grammatically correct sentences. And you know, I think, was this my last one? Oh no, I've got some pedagogical issues. I'm going to, I'm going to look at the pedagogical issues first before I go to uh, the poem on the previous slide. And one of the pedagogical issues is that it's not valued by students because the message they get is that it's not valued by teachers. So you need to communicate some passion for poetry. You need to read some poetry and think very carefully about what it's trying to say. And of course, what helps is good quality poetry, although of course that's going to always be problematic. You know, who gets to say what's good poetry? And there's a perception that poetry serves no pedagogical purpose. Well, I've just, I hope I've explained that it certainly does serve a pedagogical purpose. And teachers lack of pedagogical content knowledge, and here, here are some examples of, of uh, vocabulary associated with poetry. Cadence, rhythm, tempo, assonance, alliteration, enjambment, I rhyme, rhyme schemes, stanza, patterns. All of these are not complex concepts and they're easily checked via a quick search on the internet. And I think if you read Wing Jan, she presents poetry in a very engaging and and um, engaging way and her activities are excellent as well. But my something I really want to emphasise is that just like with any genre, the teaching of poetry as a genre, as a discrete subject, separate from everything else, is not the ideal way to go. It's quite common, we have units of poetry and then poetry is never touched on again after that point. I think poetry should be a part of every lesson or a part of every unit. I can't see why it can't be, you know, given all the different genres of poetry and the different purposes to which it can be put. And now I'm going to go back and end with a, on a philosophical note. And it's Wordsworth. <laughs> shouldn't go to. I should look at poetry from other cultural contexts. I really should. But what I love about this is the message. See if you can <laughs> guess what the message is. I've got the answer down here, so I don't need to tell you. And you know, just looking at the the number of um, beats in a line, and how the the rhyming sequence. So each so room, cells, citadels, 
Loom Bloom, Fells Bells, Doom, Me, Bound Ground. There is a there is a um, a reason for the rhyming sequence, and if we read this, we'll see that the message is not made clear. It's suggested by a series of examples. And let's look at these examples. Nuns fret not at their convent's narrow room, and hermits are contented with their cells, and students with their pensive citadels. Now you can see how this is really useful for introducing words that students might not otherwise encounter in other texts. <coughs> this is why narratives and poetry are so important. They introduce students to such a wide range of uh, vocabulary. Maids at the wheel, the weaver at his loom, sit blithe and happy. Bees that soar for bloom, high as the highest peak of furnace fells, will murmur by the hour in foxglove bells. In truth, the prison unto which we doom ourselves no prison is, and hence for me, in sundry moods, to pastime, to be bound within the sonnet's scanty plot of ground. Pleased if some souls, for such their needs must be, who have felt the weight of too much liberty, should find brief solace there as I have found. So clever! So clever, what is the message? And this is how we can encourage students to really look at the meaning of words, to look at the these um, lines, well not always lines, but also phrases as metaphors, all representing the sim a similar thing. And it's confinement of being in a small and confined space, whether physically or mentally. And so the message is that liberty is, carries a weight and responsibility and that too much liberty can actually be a burden. And so many will prefer the convent's narrow room, a cell, a pensive citadel, you know, the story of the, uh, the artist in his attic, the weaver at his loom or maids at the wheel, how they can sit quietly as they they treadle and work and weave. And how bees who can fly anywhere will murmur by the hour in a tiny in tiny foxglove bell. So you can see how beautiful this the imagery is in this and how it communicates uh, a different view of what it means to be free or confined. You know, this structure is great, you know, too much liberty and there's anarchy. There's no safety. There's no, um, there is no future consistency. You, you can't predict what will happen if there is too much liberty and anarchy. And at the other end of the scale, you can see that confinement can actually be more liberating because it's um, the body might be confined, but the mind is free to roam. So here, body's confined, but there is so much to be found, even in that perhaps you'll find more, might reflect on more if you confine yourself to a certain quiet quietude. Whereas running around, running around, traveling the world and doing everything and seeing everything and knowing everything, uh, the weight of such liberty may not necessarily result in any sense of peaceful contemplation. You know, there's, there's a lot you can discuss, but it needs to be used at the right time after a particular event or to make a particular point. And certainly, language needs to be at the level of the students. So this is really for you. <laughs> Or maybe, or I'll take it back, it's for me because I love this poem. Anyway, thank you very much if you've listened 
this far. <laughs> I thank you for listening and I look forward to ha having another discussion on a particular genre next week. <laughs>